I was laughing a bit as I heard Ryan say we have a lot in common. He's really athletic, and I'm tall, and that's all. He's very smart and writes good, good books, and I am smart enough to read them. So <coughs> we, uh, we share at least those things. Um, <coughs> before I get started with my talk in, in, in really in full, I want to do something a bit unique. I, I want to show a video, and I'm going to set this up a minute. I want to show a video because, in part, this was supposed to be Brooks Buser's session. He couldn't be here. He had to go overseas to spend some time with some of our missionaries and be of encouragement to them, and so he wasn't able to be here. He's the president of Radius International, and I want to show a bit of a film about his life. Um, I, I will say because, you know, I know I'm mindful that I'm at a Presbyterian conference <coughs> showing videos in the midst of talks is not really a thing that you do on the Lord's Day, um, but I'm a former megachurch evangelical pastor, so this is safe for me. Don't try this at home. The, uh, I would encourage you. I do want to say that I met a man in 1999 named Brad Buser, and Brad is really um, if you will, the, the primary founder of Radius International, I was a co-founder with him. He had just returned from spending 20 years with a formerly cannibalistic tribe um, named the Ateti. They're in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. He lived and labored there. He suffered um, greatly there, and he saw the people come to the Savior there. The church was planted. The Bible was translated. And I first met him when he arrived back from Itedi in 1999, and he was a man, if you will, on fire to talk about the thousands of other people groups just like the Itedis. And when he told me about this, I was stunned. I was ignorant um, and a bit shocked by the whole thing and, and moved to think something needs to be done about that. I was then privileged to meet and become a supporter of two of his sons, Brooks Buser, who's the president of Race International, and Brandon Buser. Brooks Buser went to the Yembe Yembe people group, and Brandon Buser went to the BM. So just among those three men in that family, three unreached language groups have been reached. Churches have been planted. The Bible's been translated. Um, Brooks, as I said, went to the Yembe Yembe his team spent 14 years there. They learned language um, really quickly. They had an incredible facility for language. They were only there 14 years. They created a written orthography for the Yembe Yembe. They translated the Bible. Actually, their Bible translation um, is in the Museum of the Bible. If you go there, you can see it. Um, translated the Bible. They told the Yembe's about Christ, beginning in Genesis, and the church was born and it flourished. Brooks then returned to the Yembe Yembe to present to them the translated New Testament. The, the Old Testament is in progress, nearly done, but he presented to them the translated New Testament. Um, and by the grace of God, friends of, of ours uh, chose to pay for a film crew to go to the Yembe Yembe on the day that Brooks and his team brought them the Word of God for the first time in their own language. And I want to show you um, the video that we captured of that day. Um, this isn't play acting. This was the day it happened um, in real time, and I want you to see that. So we're going to start there. After nine years, the moment has come. The missionaries have phased out of the tribe, leaving a church body with trained pastors for a new generation. The last step is providing them with a Bible in their native tongue. This occasion is honored by a dedication that brings hundreds of native believers, neighboring missionaries, and even supporters from back home. It's a celebration of heavenly proportions. I wanna hear the music play. I want to hear the trumpet sound I want to hear you call my name And watch my feet lift off the ground I'll be ready Oh, and I won't quit Chasing your heart Just like that Oh, I 
used to wonder, what am I doing here? Will this matter? Will it even last? Now I just stand in wonder. How did God take us, a few regular people, to this remote village in the middle of the jungle to plant the seed of his word and watch it grow, watch it transform and see the dead brought to life and hear a new people proclaim God's glory in their own language. This is just one story of one tribe, but there are thousands just like them, still waiting to hear. So, um, I don't know if you can, if you've ever had new Bibles at your church and had people respond that way. Um, I, I think we often take for granted the rich privilege we have having the, the Word of God in our language, hearing the Gospel, being able to have it, copies of it in our home and being able to read it. It's an incredible blessing. But what a privilege and joy it is, saints, for um, Brooks to have had the privilege with his team to bring the gospel to the Yembe Yembe, um, what a good use of his life. And there, as he said, are thousands more people groups like these. They range anywhere from the size of his tribe, which is mere thousands, to people groups in some Muslim regions that reach up into 10 million. They have no church, no um, access to the gospel, no Bible in their language. This is what Radius trains people to do. This is what GPTS is now partnering 
with Radius to train people to do. That's what I'm hoping Presbyterians will rush to do. Uh, with that said, look with me at Romans 15. Romans 15. We're going to look at verse 14 and following. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very, very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace of God, or the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in the spiritual blessings, they also ought to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we ask, as we come to this, the word of the head of the church, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, this word superintended by the Holy Spirit, as Paul wrote, for the sake not only of the church in Rome, but for the sake of your church in every age and place, we pray that the Spirit would bless the word to our hearing. That we would understand Paul's ambition and that the church in our own day would share that ambition. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember asking Brad Buser, Brooks' dad, how he endured all the suffering that he endured. And here's the thing. It's, it, when I asked that question, I wasn't just talking about the years of loneliness or fatigue or discomfort. I wasn't just talking about the numerous diseases that he suffered from, the opposition that he faced or the hard labors that he went through. For Brad, when I asked that question, he knew what I meant. What I meant on top of all that is after 20 years of that, you stood in an airport and watched your two sons with their wives and your grandchildren get on a plane to go do the same thing, knowing 
that you and your wife Beth, after all your sacrifice, would sacrifice once again, really living a life in which you never got to enjoy the company of your grandchildren. How did you give your life to that? And he immediately replied to me, Chad, it's worth it. Jesus is worth it. One day, I will never forget this, one day, I will have the joy of standing before the Lord and saying, here's the Teddy Church. I laid down my life for her. Here's the churches that my sons laid down their life to bring before you. Brad gave his blood, sweat, and tears, his financial and physical security, his great privilege of seeing his kids and grandkids grow up to this end, that this people group, that these people group, might know the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Teddy Church for Brad is a kind of priestly offering that he longs to present to the Lord. He does not believe that the Teddy Church is his justification before God. He knows that Jesus is his justification. He means that the Teddy Church is his glory and his joy and his crown and his boasting before the Lord. Now, I've had the unspeakable privilege of supporting and working with these men who have suffered so much loss for the sake of Christ being known among the nations. These men, in, in one sense of whom the world is not worthy. The love of God in Christ compelled these men and their wives to lay down their lives to carry the gospel to the furthest reaches of the earth. The lives of such men actually resonate with all of us, I think, because we have the same spirit of Christ dwelling in us. And the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, and, and I want us to be continued to be challenged, if you will, to follow their example. So I want to begin by looking at that, this passage in Romans together, and I really want to take it in two parts. We're, we're largely going to focus on the first few verses here. Here's what the two parts are. What is our priestly offering, or what our priestly offering is, and how our priestly offering is made acceptable? That, that's essentially what I'm going to get at here as Paul speaks of his priestly offering and how it's made acceptable. So what our priestly offering is, and here's what I'm going to argue, um, at least one of the church's priestly offering is, is the Gentile nations, the nations who've never heard. So look at Romans 15 and verse 14 with me. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace, of God, grace, the grace given me by God. Sorry. Now, Paul's writing to the church at Rome. He knows that they have been planted, not by him nor by any apostles we're aware of, that they have been growing in the faith, so that their faith is heard of in all the world. But he has to remind them of some things. And, and we've read largely through Romans, I'm sure, as church. All of you have been reading through this book numerous times, so you know some of the things that Paul's reminding them of. But notice what he says about the grace given me by God, verse 16. The grace given by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What is his priestly offering? He's offering the Gentiles, the peoples. This maps on to what he's told us in more than one place in Romans. If just keep your hand there and look at Romans 1. Romans 1. And just notice how this letter is introduced. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning what? Concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
through whom we receive grace and apostleship to bring about, now hear this, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, all the peoples, it's the same language, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. This is how he, if you will, ends the book. Look at Romans 16. Romans 16 and verse 25, it is a doxology. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul's ministry is to the Pantata Ethne, to all the peoples. That is precisely the command that Jesus gives in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's precisely that Pantata Ethne is what we also see in Luke 24. All nations beginning from Jerusalem. And Paul clearly follows the pattern laid down by Jesus in the Great Commission and given to him in his own apostolic calling. Friends, the book of Romans contains some of the most exalted doctrine in all of Scripture, and it does so in the context of what is arguably a missionary support letter. Now, why do I refer to it as a missionary support letter? Look at chapter 15 and verse 22. This is the reason, I'll get to the reason in a minute, this is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles or the nations have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to also to them in material blessings. I, I want you to know what Paul's saying here. First, he tells the church at Rome why he's been hindered in coming to them. That being hindered to coming to them is a reference to the missionary work he's been doing. Look at verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles of the nations to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the Spirit of God, so that, or the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. See, that's the the work he's been doing. Second, he tells them his work is complete from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. I have fulfilled the ministry. Now look at what he says in verse 23. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for years, many years to come to you, I hope to see you in, in passing as I go to Spain. So first he's telling them, I, I've been delayed from coming to you because of my missionary work. Second, he tells them, that missionary work from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum is complete. Third, he tells them that he wants their support for his mission work in Spain in 1524. He's going to tell them that again in 1528. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, that's to the church in Jerusalem, I will leave for Spain by way of you. So he wants their support for his mission work in Spain, but first he must complete his work in Jerusalem. So Paul clearly wants their support in his missionary work, particularly as he goes to Spain. But I want to linger for a moment on why Paul is so driven to go to Spain and how Paul can say what he does in Romans 15.23. Because we read over this text and we don't stop and think about it very long. But now, now just catch the phrase, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions. 
Now, he is talking about Jerusalem in a circuitous route all the way around to Illyricum, which is modern-day southern Albania. And he's saying, in that entire stretch of land and populace, there is no more room for work for me. Now, what is his work? Gospel preaching. No more room for Paul to do gospel preaching in that entire region. That's a stunning statement, isn't it? There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and the Christian population is minuscule. The Christian population at this time in that region is arguably a lower percentage of the general population than the Christian population in the city of San Francisco. So now imagine if Paul, or let's just say a modern day pastor, if I stood up in the city of San Francisco to a group of Christians and I said, there's no more room for gospel work for me in San Francisco. Everybody would think I had lost my nuts. What is, are you crazy? Have you looked around? There's plenty of room. But Paul believed that. And now he wants to go to Spain. So what gives? What's he getting at? Well, the answer is actually comes just before it. Look at verse 20. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Now where? Not where Christ has already been named. Lest I build on someone else's foundation. <clears throat> but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. See, Christ has done his priestly work of atoning for the sins of the people in the offering of himself at the cross. He has been exalted. He is high and lifted up. This is actually a quotation from Isaiah 52, which is the beginning of the, the song of the suffering servant. Christ has offered himself for our sins. And so now... I want to, if you will, proclaim the gospel to these people who've never heard of him so I can offer that church back to him. He wants to join in the priestly work. Paul's commission from Christ was to preach the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. That's not just an, just as an aside, that's not just an, an issue of order of temporality where he historically went to the Jews first and the Gentiles. It's not just, well, preach in Jerusalem and all Judea, then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. And once they got to the ends of the earth, they just said, okay, we're done with the Jews now. Let's move along. Everywhere Paul goes, he continues to go to the synagogue to preach to the Jews, and then he goes after the Gentiles. And friends, you don't have to be a dispensationalist to hold to the need to continue to do this. The Scottish missionary movement, at its greatest, was sending people into Israel to reach the Jews and other locations to reach Jews, and was sending people to the farthest reaches of the earth, all at the same time. And we need to continue to do the same. But Paul's commission as an apostle is to go and name Christ where he's never been named. He wants to go there because Christ is not known there. He's planted churches in the other areas. That's what he's saying. I've already been to those cities, I've preached the gospel, I've planted churches, elders have been appointed, and now those churches that are there, they can reach their areas. And I'm going to go on to where the church is not. But Paul needs to press on to where Christ has never been named. Paul takes seriously the commands of Christ. The apostles, especially Paul, were commanded to make Christ known in every tribe and tongue and nation. Now, we are not apostles. We understand that. None of us were the 11 on the mountain in Galilee receiving the Great Commission initially. None of us had Christ appear to us resurrected and tell us to go to the nations. And if you think that's happened, come talk to me. We probably can set you up with appointments for counseling. But none of us have had that. But the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church. And the keys of the kingdom have been handed to us. And we continue the work given to them. 
the church carries on the work, the foundation of which was laid by the apostles. And what I'm arguing is that our churches must engage in making Christ known in our area and engage in raising up and sending missionaries to the peoples where Christ has never been named. Saints, how do we hear the news that there are over 3,000 language groups, like the one I just showed you, who have no gospel witness, no church, no Bible, no hope of hearing about Christ? How do we hear that and fail to be moved by it? The gospel must be proclaimed to the nations. This is the command of our beloved Savior and Lord. The nations are his heritage. And as his servants, we proclaim his name to them all. We raise up and send our best and brightest to them. I'm so thankful that Dr. Master pointed that out yesterday. I mean, can you imagine if you're like, yeah, we're going to send missionaries. Hey, let's send like Paul and Barnabas. We can afford to give them up. Your senior pastor. We can afford to give him up. Now, I don't mean because you think low of him. But if you have a, a great senior pastor and you think, that's the guy we'll send. That's essentially what the Church of Antioch is doing. Seminarians, um, can I plead with you to consider this need? Well, I know that your churches at home, um, and I don't mean your necessarily your personal church, but the churches in your area, in your home state or locale, are probably a mess. It was not exactly amazing in Paul's day either. I mean, read his letters. This desire to go back to the primitive New Testament church, I think, has anybody read the letters to the church at Corinth? You want to go back to that? I get that there's important work to be done at our churches at home, but brothers, there are whole people groups with no gospel light at all. They don't just need churches that are a little better than the ones they have, or a lot better than the ones they have. They need churches, period. I know you feel a strong responsibility to those whom you love and to whom you may already minister, but I urge you to think about peoples like the BMs, or the MBMBs, or the Teddies, or the Wanchies. They have never heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the first three I mentioned until the views has arrived. The, Ma the Wanchi people I just mentioned, I presently have a team from my church there. They're on this little island in Indonesia, over 50,000 people who are 100% Muslim who have never heard the gospel. Now you might think to yourself, um, I'm... I'm not uniquely qualified to, to work with um, that kind of group. I'm uniquely qualified to work with the people I already know in the place I'm from. You know John G. Patton, or Payton, sorry? Pat would kill me if he heard me say that. John G. Payton, you know what he struggled with? He struggled with that question himself. Should I stay in the effective ministry I'm participating in in Glasgow? He had a incredibly successful ministry on Green Street in Glasgow, a ministry that started tiny and grew and grew with many people being saved. And people were urging Peyton to stay. Yet Peyton was haunted by the prospect of peoples who'd never heard the name of Christ. He wanted to go to the New Hebrides, now Vanuatu. He wrote about this struggle in his autobiography. I want to read this to you. Indeed, he's talking about the opposition from the Christians around him. Indeed, the opposition was so strong from nearly all, and many of them warm Christian friends, that I was sorely tempted to question whether I was carrying out the divine will or only some headstrong wish of my own. This caused me much anxiety and drove me closer to God in prayer. But again, every doubt would vanish when I clearly saw that all at home had free access to the Bible and the means of grace, with gospel light shining all around them. 
while the poor heathen were perishing without even the chance of knowing all God's love and mercy to men. Now, an objection I often hear is, well, if you're so focused upon this yourself and calling other young men to go, then why did you plant a church in Bakersfield instead of Bella? It's a great question to ask me. I did want to go. I actually planned to go, and, and during the q and I'm happy to answer some questions about how one discerns that to some degree, but Providence, um, if you will, intervened in my life. I wrote to Brad Buse at the time, and I told Brad about the fact that my wife and I were prepared to go. I was young enough to go, healthy enough to go, um, smart enough in the sense that I had the ability to learn language to go. And I did what young people do. I wrote to somebody who I knew would give me the advice I wanted to hear. And I knew Brad would tell me, go. And Brad wrote back to me. And in all caps, you know the, that thing you do when you're basically shouting over email? In all caps said, you should not go. Now, I was stunned. There are only two men Brad has ever told not to go, me and a guy dying of brain cancer. <laughs> That's it. I wasn't entirely sure how to take it. But Brad told me at the time, I believe you are uniquely qualified to stay here and help me start uh, a center for training people to go. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. By God's grace, we've now trained hundreds of people to go. We've raised up several more from our own church. But, but young men and women, I, I kind of want to stand in, if you will, for Brooks here in saying there is no higher privilege than to lay down your life for the gospel of our Lord. There is no greater gift than to be those who are counted worthy to suffer for the name. Imagine being the first person to ever name Christ among a people group who've never heard of him. Can the life that God has given you be spent on something better than that? I know you would be giving up much to go. So much. So much would be given up to go. But as Jim Elliott, who was martyred, many of you know about in South America, said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Yes, your life will be exhausted for Christ, but you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And the sufferings of this present world are not worth comparing to the glory to be revealed in heaven. I know you'll likely ask, well, who's sufficient for these things? I'm not sufficient for these things. How can I make an offering to the Lord of a people group? I don't speak well. I'm not that gifted. That leads to my second point. How our priestly offering is made acceptable. If we're going to make a priestly offering to the Lord, how is it made acceptable to the Lord? And the answer is simple. It's sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So look again at verse 16. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable. How does that happen? Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Our priestly offering of the church among the nations is made acceptable by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit applies the work of Christ to his people as they hear the word of God. Look at what he says in verse 17. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. While Paul as an apostle had the signs of an apostle attending his ministry, it is ultimately, if you listen to Paul, the ordinary means of grace through which the Holy Spirit sanctified the church. The Spirit worked extraordinarily through this apostle who helped lay the foundation of the, work of, of the church. So yes, his ministry in that sense 
is accompanied by um, the power of signs and wonders in a way that ours is not. Yet, even in Paul's case, he never states that I hope to continue my ministerial service and fulfill my calling by the power of signs and wonders. He says in verse 20, look, and thus I make it my ambition not to do signs and wonders, but to what? To preach the gospel. He told the Ephesian elders that his race, um, his received ministry is to testify to the gospel of God. He told the Corinthian church that he commends himself as a minister by an open statement of the truth. He commanded Timothy to preach the word in season and out of season. He told the, the church at Colossae, him we, what? Proclaim. Him we proclaim. This is the ministerial work in which Paul is engaged, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he believes, he believes this is the means which the Holy Spirit attends with power to sanctify the elect. That's why he tells the church at Rome, I am eager to preach the gospel to you, those of you who are at Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And that really leads to two implications I want to drive out here. The church's work is accomplished, first one, the church's work is accomplished by administering the ordinary means of grace. This missionary work is accomplished by administering the ordinary means of grace. And second, the church's work is accomplished by sending and supporting ministers to defend. So let me take on that first one. The church's work is accomplished by administering the ordinary means of grace. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know he's quoting from Joel here. It's also in the sermon at Pentecost. But for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then listen to the question. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? See, this is how the Holy Spirit promises to work through us. We proclaim Christ. He attends that word with effectual saving power. We are a people who profess to rely upon the ordinary means of grace. Don't we? we have this word in our hands and in our mouths. We know it will not return void. Yes, we are clay pots, weak vessels, but we know that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. But you may struggle with the question, well, well, who am I? Who am I? And what's the answer? What answer does the Lord give to Moses and Gideon? Who am I? The answer isn't, well, you know, you're a really gifted man, Moses. You have a, you have a winsome personality. Pharaoh is going to be won over by you. His answer has nothing to do with Moses. What is it? Who am I that I... I am with you. I am with you. Gideon, who am I? I'm with you. Jesus on the mountain. Go and make disciples of all the nations. You can hear the implicit, implicit question. Who are we? I will be with you always. What does God promise us? He promises to be with us. My fear is we speak about our belief about the work of the Holy Spirit through the ordinary means and then we refuse to take the commensurate risk to make Christ known. Oh, our church is small. What are we going to do about this problem in the world? We barely have any resources. We are not the wealthiest or most gifted people that we know. Listen, I planted a church in Bakersfield. You want to know something about Bakersfield? It is called the armpit of California. You know that? I actually walked out and someone looked at me and said, you're from Bakersfield, the armpit of California. I've heard that my whole life. That's where I planted a church. With the second least 
literate population in America. My church has been in 14 locations in 17 years. We still don't have a building. Right? We're During COVID, it was like you needed a secret password to find us. Wandering all over the city. I'm not kidding. And, and yet, as a small church without very many resources, mostly young people, we said, yeah, we're small, but our God is not. So let's step out in faith and see what the Lord will do. You know, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary isn't a big seminary. I mean, I've been to big seminaries. This is not one of them. It's not even close. <laughs> it's a bold move for them to say, we're going to be a nursery for missionaries. But I, I want to ask the question, do we believe what Paul tells us or not? For consider your calling, brother. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. It is precisely because we are those who are convinced that the Holy Spirit is powerfully at work through ordinary people and through ordinary means that we can boldly step out, step forward with a man like William Carey and say, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And I wonder when we don't, if we really believe what we're selling. Do we really believe that the Holy Spirit is actively at work through this word to save his people in every tribe and tongue or nation? Or do we somehow sort of harbor small thoughts of God in our hearts or some unbelief that unless we are more gifted and we are more wealthy and we have greater you know, wisdom in the world sense, we can't get it done? Second, the church's work is accomplished by sending and supporting ministers to this end. If we're to do this work, then we must send gospel ministers. Look at what Paul says in Romans 10, 15. And how are they to preach? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You know, in Isaiah 52, 7, it's how beautiful are the feet of him who preaches the good news, and now that's being applied to the ministers who are being sent out as representatives of Christ to preach the good news. We send forth gospel ministers. We train our best and send them to the task. And as we send them forth in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim Christ to the nations um, who've never heard of him, we trust the Lord to do the work. What about young women? I can address more of this in the Q&A, but I keep being asked, what use can you be? Well, first, your life can be spent in support of husbands who exhaust themselves in this task. I will tell you, a man exalting himself in this task um, can never be more blessed than he can be and supported in it than he can be other than by God himself than by his wife. A good wife is the glory of her husband. She is the best thing about him. Second, your life can be spent in preaching the gospel to women. I, I, I want to address this briefly. We have to have well-trained women because there are people groups in the world, especially in the Muslim areas of the world that, um, and in certain parts of India, where um, men and women aren't allowed to be taught in the same room together in each other's presence. So if we don't have well-trained women to teach those women, those women go without hearing the gospel. I'm not saying to give them an MDiv just to be clear. <laughs> I'm saying we need to train them well because these women in these people groups won't hear the gospel if we don't have some well-trained women to do it. 
who will reach those women if we don't do that, young women? What women would we rather have than an army of well-trained Presbyterian women? I'm sure Greenville would be happy to have you in their MAR program. I don't want to speak too heavily to that, but I do know that Greenville has made a significant commitment to this end. Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary grasps the need to train missionaries who can be sent to the ends of the earth in a way that I don't ordinarily see. They, they've actually just put it on their new website. I'm sorry if I gave that away because you haven't hard launched it yet, but you can go to their new website. They actually put it on there that they want to be a, a nursery for missionaries. That's using Old Princeton's langu language. Old Princeton sent nearly one in three of their graduates to the mission field. Do you know any seminary that is confessionally faithful, academically rigorous, and is sending one in three of their people to foreign missions? And by God's grace, I have no lack of confidence that Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary can do the same thing because we have the same God and the means of grace are the same. We can see a seminary of the highest caliber with deep commitment to our confessional heritage raising up an army of foreign missionaries. So I encourage you to give generously to the seminary. They didn't pay me to say that. Give to their MDiv and missionary church planting. Give to their library. If they don't have space to train these people, they, they're not going to get trained. Pray regularly that the Lord will be pleased to smile upon this seminary in a manner similar to that, what he did at Old Princeton at that time. I do pray that the Lord is pleased to work in our Presbyterian churches with such power that the light of his gospel spreads across the world to those who've never heard it. John Payton once wrote, I claimed Aniwa for Jesus, and by the grace of God, Aniwa now worships at the Savior's feet. When Brooks and I arrived on Aniwa, shooting our film on the life of John Payton, we were struck by our meeting with the Islanders. We came onto the Islander. They had scarcely seen any white people, um, maybe a decade or more since they'd seen any. Thankfully, Brooks was able to speak their language, which was a special treat to watch. And so Brooks started asking them, can you tell me the gospel? And they articulated a clear gospel. And then they were thrilled to show us their two Presbyterian churches. First and second Presbyterian of Aniwa, I suppose. They had one up high and one down low. Peyton started in the lowland, and they took us. They know about John G. Peyton. They're thankful for him. They took us to the spot where they, where, where they were converted and where they first had communion. They have it marked as a church. They showed us where his children and grandchildren are buried. Brothers, I can't quantify for you how thrilling that moment was for us. This Scottish Presbyterian minister laid down the life of his first wife, six of his children, two of his grandchildren, and suffered immensely to make Christ known. And that offering of his life is still bearing gospel fruit to this day in Aniwa. May our Presbyterian churches claim these un unevangelized nations for Christ. May the Lord be pleased to save them. And may it be our joy and crown to stand before the Lord and offer him the churches that are born in those unreached language groups. Let me end with the words of J.W. Alexander. If Christianity is what it purports to be, if the danger of blinded heathenism is such as the New Testament declares, and if Christ's dying command has such a latitude and force as has been affirmed, that it is the plain, imperative, immediate duty of all among us who bear the ministerial name to lay ourselves out in carrying forward this very work of foreign missions.
Amen. Let me pray. Father, we ask that you would be pleased to work powerfully in us by your Spirit to believe, act upon the word that we profess. We confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He alone is our Savior, that there is no salvation apart from Him. We believe that the Word of God is attended by the Spirit of God and made effectual to the hearts of men as Your ministers proclaim it. May we, Father, step out in faith, knowing who you are, what you are, and carry Christ to the ends of the earth, to the places that we admittedly feel unable to reach in our own strength, rightly recognize that we are too weak to carry forward on our own. And may we believe what we profess. that your spirit is at work right now in our world to make Jesus known by the preaching of the gospel to every tribe and tongue and nation. May we see many young people in this room even rise up and go. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we singing a hymn?